Warning, this channel covers multiple real life true crime stories and we'll dive into some graphic or disturbing details of death or abuse. Please do not continue if this is something that you will not be comfortable watching. Viewer discretion is advised. Lorne Giddings was a dedicated law student that attended the one and only Mercer University. Lauren had dreams of becoming a defense attorney one day, and as it appeared, she was doing just that. In 2011, Lauren was actively working her way closer and closer to having a career of her own, and her career dreams coming true. Lauren had many friends in what appeared to be a fairly active social life. However, she was also known to spend a lot of her time studying, and doing productive things on her own. Which makes sense, considering she only had one more test remaining before passing the bar exam. June 25th, 2011 rolls by, and a friend of Lauren's grew a little bit concerned about her. Lauren hadn't returned any of her calls, texts, nothing. This friend had hoped that Lauren was just studying, but as time went by, she grew more and more concerned. Because of this, the friend decided to visit Lauren's apartment and knock on the door. Knock, knock, no answer. Knock, knock again, again, no answer. So Lauren's friend decided, something must be wrong here and called Lauren's sister directly. Lauren's sister claimed that she also hadn't heard from her, nor had she gotten any replies from Lauren that day. At this point, the friend became increasingly anxious and decided to use Lauren's spare keys to enter the apartment herself. Upon entry, she found nothing, an apartment full of belongings, but no Lauren in sight. This did not provide any relief as to the whereabouts of Lauren Giddings. In fact, this only caused further concern, as some of the items that were left in Lauren's apartment seemed unusual. She found Lauren's keys, her phone, her purse, and was startled to notice that her law books were laying around as well. Local law enforcement became aware of this incident and immediately launched an investigation. To their knowledge, Lauren Giddings was a fairly popular student and was last seen drinking at a local bar and gave nobody the impression that she was planning to up and leave. They initially began their search in Lauren's apartment, where they were unable to locate any visible evidence. They reported that there were no signs of struggle. During that search, Law enforcement seemingly caught the scent of a community garbage can for the complex. What they found inside was the limbless corpse of a female. They immediately sent this evidence for further examination. When the DNA came back to match that of Lauren Giddings, the local law enforcement decided to begin their investigation close to home, inside Lauren's apartment complex. Introducing Stephen McDaniel. Several students had mentioned that a Mr. Stephen McDaniel was another student at their university and was a quite creepy individual. He would frequently ask other students how they would get away with the perfect murder, for example, and also that Stephen is actually Lauren's direct neighbor. Stephen McDaniel was born in Atlanta and expired to become a judge one day. Among his peers, he was known as socially awkward but kind of controlling. He gave many people the impression that he was somebody that enjoyed to have the power in every situation. When Stephen moved into the apartment complex where Lauren Giddings was living, Lauren told friends that he actually asked her out a few times, but Lauren was not interested and found him a little bit creepy. Stephen's friends would also say that Stephen's apartment would often remind them of a bunker. Stephen also liked to write, as he written a 56-page manuscript he named The Story of Traverse. Now, in the past... Lauren had noticed that somebody had broken into her apartment, though she had gone back to living a hopefully normal life there until she finished university. Unfortunately for Lauren, there was somebody lurking nearby that had other plans. One night, Lauren woke up to someone looming over her. As she reacted to this, the man attacked her, and as she tried to defend herself, she was overcome. Stephen McDaniel strangled Lauren Giddings to death. At this point, Stephen decides that he needs to hide the body. Stephen takes the body into the bathtub and cuts off all of Lauren's limbs, including Lauren's head. 
He then cleaned her apartment to the point of zero detection by the naked eye, stuffed Lauren's body into different garbage bags, and in the morning, before the garbage truck could come by, he placed those bags into different trash cans in the neighborhood. He then went on to living a normal day with the hopes of having pulled off what he had believed was the perfect murder. Later that day, a news reporter had encountered Stephen and asked him if he would like to be in a TV interview. That's when this happened. And no one's heard from her since. Did you see her hang out with anyone at the time or anything like that? I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, you always hear noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. And you, uh, she just recently graduated from Mercer? Yeah, she and I, were, we were both JD students. Um, we graduated back in May. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you, what did you see? I mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much a people person. Do you know anybody that, any enemies she might have had, somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I mean, we're, we don't know where she is. I mean, the only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. Because, I mean, we went, at, we went over, one of her friends had a key, we went inside and tried to see if there was anything amiss, but, I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it, so there was no sign that anyone broke in. I mean, the door was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. Stephen is about to find out that the main part of his perfect murder has already been foiled. The torso of Lauren Giddings had already been found in the trash can at his apartment complex. It was found between the time he left and before the truck could actually come by to pick it up. The torso was found by the law enforcement officers that began their search in Lauren's apartment. Ironically, had the police not began their search that morning, they would have not parked in a way that essentially blocked the access of the garbage truck driver, which would have already made the stop at Lauren's apartment complex, but decided to reroute and come by later instead. What about um, in the like the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? I, I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I, I think I need to sit down. Okay. Stephen is now aware that his master plan is already spiraling out of control. As he is sitting here, the amount of emotion and absolute panic he is feeling must be overwhelming him in multiple ways, making it hard to think or act normally. Yet, he continues the act. You've been studying for the bar? Uh, I... No one had seen her since Saturday because I, we all just... There's not a whole lot of interaction unless we're doing classes. Right. And she was doing an uh, online version of it. You all so, studied together, though? I, uh, we were in, there's, there's two different people, that, there's two companies that provide it. Captain provides it and Barbary provides it. I signed up with Barbary and I've been doing the lectures that they have in the mornings. She was doing the Kaplan online, so I hardly ever saw her. I, mean, I would see her like go out running, but I mean, What time would she go out running? I mean, I don't even know when. Was it I, at night or morning? I, I saw her like midday a, a couple weeks ago. I mean, that was the last time I saw her was coming back from the bar prep on the main campus because we got moved over there for a week or two. But she normally would run. That was the yeah, I mean, that she, she, she ran all the time. I mean, she, she had a group that she would go running with. I mean, I, I, I don't know anyone that would want to hurt her. She was as nice a person as there is. I, was she moving soon? Did you know anything about her? Yeah, yeah. She she was going to be moving out uh, today. She was supposed to move out today because someone else was going to be moving into her apartment. A new law student. Do you know if she was signing? Where is she from? Is she uh, from Maryland? Maryland or yeah, Maryland? she's from up in can Maryland. I just put this on you so we can hear you. Is that all right? Okay. I'm so sorry. And yeah, you can just hold on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah she's from Maryland. Yeah, I mean, she she was from up in Maryland. I mean, all her family was there, as far as I know. 
mean, she... What's going on in your mind right now? Like, what are you thinking? Why would anyone do this? Stephen is not aware at this point that the officers have already brought a cadaver dog to the apartment complex and were able to locate a hacksaw inside the maintenance room. This is believed to be the saw used for the dismemberment, though it is thought to possibly be the murder weapon, as it is unknown to whether or not Lauren Giddings was deceased at the time that the dismemberment took place. Hear anything? No. Anybody? I. Yeah, I just heard something. Maybe I could have helped. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Do you want to sit down for a second? You got something to drink? Do you know if a bunch of her friends are getting together or anything? I mean, that's how I found out that she was missing. We, a bunch of her friends came over yesterday night around midnight and they they couldn't they hadn't seen her since Saturday so they were trying to find out where she was so they were knocking on neighbors doors and stuff i no they they went in they had a key to her apartment and they checked around didn't see anything out of place I mean, it was locked when everyone got there and that was midnight yeah around midnight and then we went we went over to law school to see if maybe she was over in the, the library studying or something and we, we looked up in the study rooms on the third floor and there was, there was no one there. And we came back, we looked around and just tried to find any anything to figure out where she was. She doesn't have any family in Georgia? I, I don't know. I, as far as I know, every all of her family is from in Maryland. Have you met her family before? I, I, there, there was one time that I met them. They came down first year she she had a little dog, a little brown dog, that she would uh, exercise out in front of the law school, and it got hit as she was coming across the road. I I heard the car hit it and ran out, and she was there crying. And we thankfully there was someone who came along who knew a vet or something, and they helped that. And the her family came down. I think a couple weeks after that or something. I met them just briefly, but. I mean, we, we've been trying to figure out she has a boyfriend up in Atlanta, but I mean, someone called her, called him, and he hadn't heard from her. I mean, no, no one could figure out where she was. Yeah, she went over to a couple friends' house, the Garen Mueller and Joe Karens. They live over on Walnut, and I mean, they, they said that she was over there in the morning, and then that was the last time that anyone we've been able to find out from had seen her. She had mentioned that she was going to do that day or anything? Uh, we, uh, Joe, he got onto her computer last night to see if she said anything. She'd sent an email some people Friday afternoon, like, I want to or something. And the last thing, there was an email she sent out at 10 at night, where she, she sent to, I think it was someone in Atlanta, Atlanta and he, she said that she It wasn't long before law enforcement caught wind of Stephen McDaniel. Neighbors in the complex stated that they thought Stephen was acting rather odd lately. And with Lauren's history of break-ins, coupled with previous arrest of Stephen himself, the cops decided to take him in for questioning. When they arrived at Stephen's apartment complex, they found a number of disturbing things. On his computer, they found searches for how to disable a burglar bar and the garbage route times for Macon, Georgia, and some creepy torture posts written by Stephen himself. In this apartment, they also found a pair of women's underwear, believed to be that of Lauren Giddings, some of the packaging from the hacksaw that they had found, and a master key for the apartment complex. They also found the crazy videos that Stephen had recorded himself from outside Lauren's window. When the cops were initially performing the search, it is stated that Stephen McDaniel was extremely pale, he was drinking water noticeably fast, and he was acting abnormal. They immediately arrested Stephen and brought him to the precinct for further questioning. While he was in the cop car, it is said that Stephen began to shut down even more and became completely emotionless. He locked himself into a trance-like state and was void of showing any definitive reactions. Stephen's interrogation video has become one of the most covered interrogations amongst true crime content creators. Just a simple search for Stephen McDaniel's name will bring up dozens of different videos all offering different perspectives on Stephen's case. As I am not a psychology student, nor am I a behavioral analyst, or even any form of law enforcement, I will only be playing clips from the interrogation and not covering the entire thing. However, I will place a link in the description if you would like to watch the full interrogation later on. Let's take a look at that interrogation video. <sighs> I just gotta ask you a few more questions. Okay. Uh, you came down earlier tonight, me and you talked, all right. 
You don't have any weapons on you, do you? No. That's just you are. What's wrong? You know I'm Detective Patterson, right? Yes. Do you remember? Put your hands up here. You remember us talking yes. earlier tonight, right? Yes. You remember me earlier in the day? Yes. When we came down here and talked a little bit and then we left? As you can see, Stephen has emotionally shut himself off. One can only speculate that with Stephen's background as a law student, that he believed in this moment that he may be able to play the system, as long as he doesn't show any remorse or guilt and keeps his mouth shut. Yes. Okay. I need to know about this girl right here. You know her? Yes. Who is that? Lauren Giddings. Does she live next door to you? Yes. When's the last time you seen her? Two or three weeks ago. Okay. Was you friends with Lauren? Yes. Look at me when you talk to me, son. Okay? Was you friends with her? Yes. Close friends? We were good I friends. mean, y'all were friends, right? Both yes. of y'all were law students. You're studying to be an attorney, right? Yes. What kind of law do you want to go into? Criminal law? Yes. Civil? Is that what you want to do for a living? Yes. Okay. Are you almost finished? Yes. Okay. So you don't have too much more to do, right? No. All right. Are you going to st stay here in Macon? I don't know. Did you used to work at the district attorney's office in Macon? Yes. Was you on the prosecutor side or the defense side? Prosecutor. So you were on our side? Yes. <laughs> right? You never worked on the other side? No. Did you like it when you were down there? Yes. Uh, got along with everybody? Yes. Okay. And you've lived next to Lauren for a long time? Yes. Okay. Do you know where she's at tonight? No. Hmm? No. Have you ever seen her with that dress on? No. Stephen keeps this up for the entirety of the interrogation, making the investigators increasingly irritated and confused and unsure of exactly how to get Stephen to confess. They resort to trying several different methods, which, as you can imagine at this point, receive no emotional reaction from Stephen. The tension between Stephen and the investigators is what I believe has made this interrogation so fascinating to cover over the past few years. You have no idea where she's at? No. Okay. Oh. Yes. Okay, uh, my major didn't do that? Okay. All right. All right. No. Look, just tell me what happened, brother. I don't know. Well, where's she at? I need you. I'm asking you for your help. I'm a detective, and I'm asking you for your help. Okay? I'm asking you for help. I need your help. Can you help me? I don't know. You don't know if you can help me? Yes. I need your help. Help me out. Tell me what to do. Has anybody asked you for help today? I need your help. I'm asking you as a friend for help. Can you help me? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You can't help a friend out? I don't know what you mean. I need to know what I want to say. I don't know. When's the last time you seen her? Two or three weeks ago. Has anybody, have you ever seen anybody over her house the last couple of nights? No. Okay. If you knew where she was, would you tell me? Yes. What do you think happened to her? I don't know. Do you even care that no one can find her? Yes. I mean, I don't know, do you? Yes. Do you have a girlfriend? No. Did you think Lauren was your girlfriend? No. I mean... You said you didn't have any other cars, right? Right. Well, why would your, everybody you went to school with for the last three and four years said that you own another car other than that jail prison? Everybody I've talked to, all your friends you were in school with, people that you worked at the district attorney's office with said you have other cars other than that car. And you're going to sit here today and tell me you don't have another car? I don't. Well, where's that? I don't have one. You never had another car besides that jail prison? After an agonizing interrogation, and after being presented with the copious amounts of evidence they had against him, Stephen finally cracks and confesses to the murder. Stephen himself genuinely believed that he could get away with a perfect murder, and he believed all the steps that he had taken would guarantee that that's exactly what he did. Unfortunately for Stephen, but fortunately for everybody else, he did the polar opposite of what he imagined and was caught impressively fast, immediately following the murder. After pleading guilty on April 21st, 2012, Stephen McDaniel was sentenced to life in prison. We know a few things for sure after taking all that in. One is that this entire case is an absolute tragedy, especially for Lauren and Lauren's family and friends. Two is that Stephen McDaniel is an absolutely disgusting homicidal maniac that got what he had coming to him. And three is that the only fine wine Stephen McDaniel will be drinking from now on will be straight from his cell toilet.